Proverbs 29, 18 states where there is no revelation. Other translations say where there is no vision, people perish. In other words, people go the wrong direction when they don't have vision. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Proverbs 29, 18. I'm looking at this lately as it relates to Evident Life Church, as it relates to the body of Christ in general. And as I think about this passage of Scripture, I'm just reminded that really what it's saying to the church is that blessed is the church that knows God's plans and then follows them. Blessed is the church, blessed is the people who know God's plans and then actually follow them. Today we're going to continue to unpack God's vision for Evident Life Church. As I mentioned last week on October 26th, the Evident Life Church elder team, along with Bob Blader, who was our facilitator for the weekend, we got away up north for two and a half days for the purpose of hearing the voice of God and receiving vision and direction for Evident Life Church. And I do have a picture this week, and we're believing all the slides are going to work beautifully this week, unlike last week. Uh, there we were. This was right before we uh, launched into hours and hours and hours of prayer and just seeking the Lord. We had a little light lunch at the Mogollon Moose, um, fresh from scratch daily. It was, and then it went downhill from there. Everything was fried and... and um, <laughs> So we got up north for two and a half days just to seek the Lord to get vision for this church. And the Lord began by giving us his perspective. What does God see? What is his vision for this church, for Evident Life Church? And we wanted not just to get some tips and tricks or to try to pull in some some really cool words and string some, some neat thoughts together. We went up there for the purpose of knowing what God knows, getting his perspective for this church. And so as we sought the Lord, he began to roll it out to us. And the Lord has said that Evident Life Church is a people of prayer, pursuing God, and loving others. This is the vision statement that the Lord gave us. Hey, can we all say it together? Can we do this together? Evident Life Church is a people of prayer, pursuing God, and loving others. Amen. I mean, that seems simple, doesn't it? Simple. It's a short sentence, but it's profound. And it's extremely important that we understand who God sees us as. Because this is God's dream for this church. It's his design for us as his people. And when we embrace who God has created us to be, who he has brought us together to be, that's when we're going to be the most impactful. That's when we're going to see the most advancing of his kingdom in us and through us. That's when we're going to actually be in that sweet spot that the Lord has designed us to be in, advancing in Christ and bringing Jesus in powerful ways to our community. When we know who we are, when we embrace who we are, and when we be who we are. A people of prayer, pursuing God and loving others. So the first unique identifier that the Lord has spoken over us is that we are a people of prayer. A people who really pray together. A church that's firmly planted and is growing out of what we call our taproot. And that's the taproot of prayer. A church that's experiencing the greater things of God because we are coming together as God has called us to do and we are praying. We're seeking His face. We're running into the things of the Lord together in and through the place of prayer. And so that first unique identifier, that first component of God's vision for this church is that we are a people of prayer. If you, did, if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you, go back and listen or watch it online. We, we got to start 
and stay grounded in that place of prayer. Today we're going to unpack the second unique and strategic component of God's vision, the revelation that he's given us for Evident Life Church here. And that is that we are a people pursuing God. That's the title of today's message. A people pursuing God. A people of prayer pursuing God. Now, when I was a senior at Baylor University, I went to a dance with a friend. Her name was Velvet Cook. And there we are. That's a picture. That was a picture of our first date. Literally, our first date ever. It was like a dress-up kind of a deal. And we were all dressed up, and, and we just went as friends. We didn't expect anything to happen other than we were going to get to hang out with other friends and have a good time. But let me tell you what. God had another thing coming for us. And that is that the sparks began to fly. And the embers of love were ignited on that night. I'm being serious, man. I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, we just went as friends. We thought we were just going to just have a fun time and joke. And the embers of love that night were ignited. And so what did I do? I began to pursue that woman. You know, I mean, things were stirred up in me. You know what I'm saying? I was feeling it. So I began to pursue velvet. This was in November, our first date. By December, I wrote her a Christmas letter. And in the Christmas letter, I, I, I included this phrase. I said, the greenest eyes, she has beautiful green eyes, the greenest eyes in Texas, we were going to college in Texas, the greenest eyes in Texas are haunting me tonight. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm pursuing her. You know what? I'm not messing around now. I'm pursuing her. Velvet's on my mind all day, every day. I wrote a song for her, especially for her. I'm not going to sing it right now. I spent all my spare time with Velvet. I mean, even time that I was supposed to be spending studying, I was spending with Velvet. I graduated college. She's a year younger than me. I was living in San Antonio working for USA Insurance uh, in their technology program and development area. And I would drive up every single weekend to spend as much time with her as possible. I started saving money. You know you're serious when you start saving up your money. You know what I'm saying? Started saving money. I bought a ring. I asked her to marry me. We got married. Check it out. Look at how young we were, man. We were just little babies, it looks like. We were old enough, don't worry. It was, all, it was all legal and all that. We got married. I pursued Velvet. I pursued her. Like an avid hunter going after a prize elk. It was a little more romantic than that. But that's what came to me when I was writing this down this week. A little more romantic than that. But I was pursuing Velvet pursuit. It's the act of chasing. Pursuit is the act of following, of trying to obtain. Pursuit is the act of going after, of taking effort to secure something. Pursuit is a quest. And I want you to notice that pursuit is not, it's not lazy. Pursuit is not casual. Rather, pursuit is intentional and it's intense. And I want to say that again. Pursuit is intentional and it's intense. And this is how we're called to go after God. Intentionally and intensely. Pursuit. In fact, God delights when we pursue Him. He delights in that. When we pursue Him intentionally, when we pursue Him intensely, just as He pursues us intentionally and intensely. You see, we pursue him because he first pursued us and he continues to pursue us. And his pursuit of us is very intentional and extremely intense. And so we choose now to pursue God intentionally and intensely. That's pursuit. This morning, instead of the typical three to four points, 
that we, we typically have that I do in a sermon, the Lord has highlighted some examples of what it looks like to pursue Him. And so He's painted for us some very vivid pictures of pursuit. And so we're just going to look at a few pictures from His Word, from Scripture, of what it looks like to pursue. The first picture of pursuit that we see here on the screen is the man after God's heart. King David. King David was called a man after God's heart. We, f- we find it in 1 Samuel 13. It's also reiterated in Acts chapter 13 that this guy David, this king named David, is called by the Lord a man after his heart. Why was David considered a man after God's heart? Was it because David was this awesome, holy living guy that, that never sinned against the Lord? No. Was David called a man after God's heart because he was a pastor or a priest? No, no. He was a king. He was a warrior. David was considered a man after God's heart because he was a man who pursued God. David pursued God, and he was called a man after God's heart. Listen to the heart of David. Listen to the heart of pursuit. Listen to how David describes who God is to him. Look at Psalm 63. Here's a vivid picture of pursuit. David says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. This is the heart of pursuit. We starting to pick it up a little bit? The heart of pursuit. Verse 3, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will tell others of your love. I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to let others know about it. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. In other words, I think of you all the time. I even dream about you. That's how intense I am for you, Lord. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. That sounds like a love letter, doesn't it? It does, because it is, because that's what pursuit looks like, that's what pursuit feels like, that's what pursuit sounds like, intentional, intense. Pursuit involves longing for God, thirsting for Him, earnestly seeking Him. Pursuit involves positioning ourselves in His presence And because we position ourselves in his presence, we actually get to see him and behold him. Pursuit involves extravagant praise and worship, that all-in praise and worship. Pursuit involves finding satisfaction in God alone. He's what we're looking for. Jesus is our deep desire. The only one who will fulfill the longing that we have in our heart. Pursuit involves an obsession that has us thinking of God day and night. Pursuit. This is what it looked like when I went after Velvet. It is. I couldn't get her off of my mind. I positioned myself. I worked my schedule. I did. So that I could spend as much time with her as possible. I thought about her when I woke up. I thought about her when I went to bed. I took walks with her. I sat with her on the special swing on the Baylor campus. I don't know if we can get that picture up now or not. Check this out. Now, that's not us. This is a more modern picture, but that's the swing. The same swing 
that we would sit at in between classes and hold hands and, and talk and, and dream. We would take walks and we would walk down the Brazos River and across this beautiful bridge that would go across the Brazos, holding hands. And at that time, it was a dangerous area, risking our lives to spend time <laughs> with one another. I pursued her. And I still pursue her. I still pursue my wife. Men, we're called to pursue our wives. Keep pursuing your wife. And this is what it looks like and what we're called to do with God. We're called to pursue Him. To be men and women who are after His heart. We're after His heart. He's our deep desire. I want you to look to somebody and just say, I will pursue him. Just make that statement even right now. If you're willing, if you mean it, say, I will pursue him. I will pursue him. And let me tell you this. If you're saying that to your spouse, if your spouse is sitting next to you, I'm serious. Would you look to your spouse and say, I will pursue you too? I mean, mean it. Make that commitment. I will pursue you too. Amen. And do it. It's worth it. It's worth it. And so King David gives us our first picture of pursuit. Let's look at picture of pursuit number two. Uh, it's the bride and the bridegroom. See, King David passed down to his son Solomon an understanding of pursuit. We've talked about that before, about leaving a legacy of faith that we can really pass some significant, important things down to our children and grandchildren and, and generations that follow. King David passed down an understanding of pursuit to Solomon. And so in the Song of Solomon, some of Solomon's writings, we see the second picture of pursuit. And if you would turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, beginning of verse 2. Check out this pursuit. Let him, the bridegroom Jesus, Kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Men, hang with me here. All right? It's a scripture. It's good stuff. I want to point this out. The Lord is tender. This is one of the tender places of scripture, right? Song of Solomon. But the Lord's also tough. So men, as, as the, the women here in our church... Always have to hear about the battles and, and the, the warfare and, and the, the races that are being run and all of that stuff. We can hang with a little tenderness right here from the Song of Solomon. This is the heart of God. This is a picture of pursuit right here. Let him, the bridegroom, Jesus, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Now the kisses of his mouth, that's referring to his words, the word of the Lord, the logos and the rhema word. Let, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is more delightful than wine. In other words, nothing in the world holds a candle to you. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. So take me away with you. and Let us hurry. In other words, I want to run away with you. I'll drop everything for you. I'm so desperate for you. I only want to spend time with you. Let the king bring me into his chambers. This is a picture that displays pursuit. It displays the intimacy that's involved in pursuit. I want to dive very quickly into the third picture of pursuit now. Picture number three is the hidden treasure in the pearl. The hidden treasure in the pearl, we're going to be jumping up to the New Testament, a little NT right now. Going from the OT to the NT, come on now. Third picture of pursuit. Jesus told some parables. He told parables to teach his disciples, to teach us about the kingdom of God. Now, two of the shorter parables that Jesus taught reveals that God's kingdom involves pursuit. And when we turn to Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 44, we can check out these two parables that involve some serious, intentional, and intense pursuit. 
verse 44 of Matthew 13. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven, now the kingdom of heaven is also synonymous with the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, what is the kingdom of God? I would argue that the kingdom of God is God's manifest presence. The kingdom of God is his grace. It's his, his love revealed right here and right now. That's the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he had to find it. He had to pursue it. He had to find it. But when he found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought that field. Pursuit. Intentional. Intense. Verse 45, again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, God's manifest presence, his grace, and his love, right now, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, he sold everything he had, he sold everything he had, and he bought it. He had to have it. He couldn't live another moment without it. Pursuit. Intentional, intense. Do you see that? Pursuit involves priority. Pursuit correlates with value. Priority and value. Intentional, intense. So Jesus is painting this picture for us that involves seeking, finding, enjoying the greatest prize on the planet. These are pictures of pursuit. Those who make pursuit a priority, those who are intentional and intense with their pursuit are going to be those who get to experience the value of pursuit, and that is joy. Joy comes from pursuit. See, Jesus is revealing in Matthew 14 that the kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything else on this earth but gaining God is a happy trade-off. I like the way John Piper describes it. John Piper says this. He says that we can lose everything with joy if we gain Christ. We can lose everything with joy not with heartache or regret as it was spoken of earlier. We can lose everything with joy if we gain Christ. And that's what we gain when we lose everything. Church, we gain Jesus. So let's gain him with joy. With joy. This final picture of pursuit, I want to focus on that important word called joy. Y'all want to talk about joy a little bit? J-O-Y, joy, J-O-Y, not J-O-B. Although you can find J-O-Y in your J-O-B if you're doing it for G-O-D. Did you follow me? You can find joy in your job if you're doing it as unto the Lord. Amen. All right, joy. We're going to talk about joy, J-O-Y, joy. Again, verse 44 says, in his joy, Jesus says, in his joy, he went and sold all he had and he bought that field. In his joy, he pursued it, he found it, and it was a joy to buy it and to have it. The pursuit of God is not a chore. The pursuit of God is not a loss. The pursuit of God is not a downer. Rather, the pursuit of God is a joy. The pursuit of God is a joy. It's a joy. It's a joy. The Westminster Shorter Catechism states that the chief end of man, in other words, the whole reason that we're alive, we're living and breathing and walking on this earth right now, the chief end of man is to glorify God. We glorify him as we pursue him, by the way, and make him number one is to glorify God and to do what? To enjoy Him forever. And sometimes we forget about the second half of why we're here, is that we're here also to enjoy Him. And when we glorify Him, when we live for Him, 
when we pursue Him, there is great joy that comes. And it's not the kind of joy that the world tries to give us. It's the joy that comes from the very throne room of heaven that's poured out on us generously from God Himself. Joy comes from pursuit. Joy. There is great joy in pursuing God. In fact, while I'm pursuing God in the prayer room, which I make time every week, make it a priority, it's on my schedule, it's blocked out. If something else comes at that time and I absolutely have to go to a meeting, I will not erase my prayer room time, but I will move it somewhere else in my schedule because it's a priority. And I'm going to be intentional about it. And often I get intense about it. And there are times as I'm pursuing God in that place of prayer where I'll, I'll have my guitar on and, and I'll be walking around the room. I don't always use my guitar, but man, I'm just recalling even right now, there are times when I have that guitar strapped over my shoulder and I just start walking around the room and I start singing songs that I know that we know that we sing on Sundays, but then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just takes me into singing prayers, just like new songs, just prayers, things that are coming out of my heart and I just start singing them and declaring them. And, 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 it's, and at a point, it just seems like almost every time this happens, I get to this place of intensity where all of a sudden I come into the presence of God, I experience His grace and His love right there in that moment and I begin weeping. Tears of joy start flowing down my face because there is joy found in pursuit. Joy comes from pursuit. And if I can do that, big, tall, football, basketball player who still likes to wrestle and I was punching Heath earlier before the service. I was all riled up, man. We were exchanging punches and told me I'd break my hand if I punched him in the chest because, you know, he's just so solid and all that stuff, and he is really solid, by the way. <laughs> but what I'm saying is finding that kind of joy in the Lord is not some kind of sissy thing. If you want to come call me a sissy, let's do that afterwards out back, all right? <laughs> But it's not some kind of sissy thing. It's a gift that we have from God. That when we pursue him, that we will find joy. I mean, for real. Joy. 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 Joy comes out of pursuit, out of pursuing God. Another pastor told the story of his sister. His sister lost her husband to cancer. He was in his 50s. He'd been a faithful follower of Christ, though. Steady and joyful, catch that? Steady and joyful, the sister who was losing her husband was sitting by her husband's special bed. She was wiping her husband's forehead in those last hours. One visitor became irritated and asked her, how, how can... Can you be so happy when something so evil is happening right now to your husband? She answered, my husband deserves to go to hell like you and me, but because of Christ, because Jesus pursued him and because he pursued Jesus. In a few hours, my husband will be with God in heaven. And is that not re worth rejoicing over? She understood that that pursuit results in great joy, eternal joy. In his joy, Matthew 13, 44, in his joy, he did what? He goes, he sells all that he had, and he bought that field. He couldn't live another day, another moment without it. He gave up everything. He pursued intentionally and intensely. He had to have it. That's pursuit. And we are a people who are pursuing God because we've tasted and seen that there's nothing else in this world that will satisfy us. There's nothing else that holds a candle to him. And we're not going to mess around any longer. We're not going to drag our feet. 
We're not going to play games. We're not going to play any church games. We're not, gonna, we're not just going to kind of go through this life and whatever will be, will be, and it'll all pan out in the end. That's not why we're here. We're here to glorify God and to enjoy Him. And so we will pursue Him. We will be intentional and we will be intense. We will pursue God. So I want to ask all of us here, what are we pursuing? You know, we got to get there, right? We got to get real with it. We got to get introspective. We got to look at our real lives here. Look at, look at our lives, church. What are we really pursuing? Let's be honest with ourselves. What are we pursuing? What are we spending our time, our treasure, and our talents on? That's going to give us an idea of what we're pursuing. What is it that we won't give up every single day, every single week? What is it that gets the first place? What are we pursuing? Who are we pursuing? As a church, Evident Life is here to pursue God, not simply bump into Him every once in a while as we stay busy with life. Uh uh. It's not how we're going to roll, it's not how we do roll. See, I'm preaching the choir here. This, This vision statement that the Lord gave us isn't new news. I mean, those of you who have been around are like, duh, no kidding. We're people of prayer pursuing God and loving others. That's just who we are. Yeah, that's right. It's who we've always been. It's who God created us to be, and it's who we continue to be. We're a people of prayer pursuing God and loving others. And so we won't do this casually. It's not about bumping into God if we're lucky. It's about pursuing Him. Pursuing Him. So we're pursuing God. Next week, we're going to continue to explore God's vision for Evident Life Church. You all want to do that? we got one more, one more thing to handle with our vision. You ready to do that? Yes. Next week, we're going to do that. It's going to be about loving others. Extremely important component to the perspective and the vision that God has for us as a church. Can't be the church that God's called us to be without loving others. We're also going to be revealing and launching some of our one-year and three-year plans that the Lord gave us vision for, revealed to us while we were at our two-and-a-half-day vision retreat. So I want to encourage you to, to, to be present because you're going to hear what God is doing, where he's leading us, how he's leading us, what it's going to look like and feel like, how the Lord is going to help us be who he's called us to be, how we can be successful at this. Because so often it feels like, man, there's just so much that, that God's Word says you know, we're supposed to be about, and I, and I always feel like a failure. I just never feel like I can really get it all done, and, and I'm always having to choose. Do I pray, or do I fellowship, or, or do I, what do I do? And, and I'm always, oh. The Lord is revealing, giving us vision for how to live this way successfully. How to make it happen for real. So we're going to be rolling out some of that vision, some of that revelation that the Lord's been giving us as church leadership. So we're very excited about that. Again, I think I mentioned it last week. Part of it is really involves Wednesday nights. So I want to encourage everybody here to uh, guard your Wednesday nights. You're going to be very happy that you did. Guard your Wednesday nights. uh, Carve it out. Make it a priority in your week. Rearrange other things. Other things can be rearranged. And I will tell you, as your pastor, when you do that, you will find yourself uh, extremely fulfilled and successful at these things that God is leading us into. Very successful at it. So, it's an exciting season. I want to do something before we take communion, and that is I would like for all of us to, again, say together the vision statement that God's given us. Can we put that back up on the screen? Evident Life Church, we are... Pursuing God and loving others. All right, now we got to say it with a little more oomph than that. Ready? Let's get that back up on the screen. One more time. We are a people of prayer, pursuing God and loving others. That's who we are. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the vision, the revelation that you've given us as a church. And Lord, even as we've been talking about pursuing you, Lord, we just want to, We want to turn our attention 
once again to the cross. We want to turn our attention to who you are and what you've done for us as your church. How you've saved us, God. How you've rescued us. How you took the punishment for us. How your body was broken for us. How your blood was spilled for us. And how we have new life because you pursued us in that intentional, intense, radical way. Church, as the elements are being handed out, just take them and hold them. You can sing along as we worship, and then we'll take the, uh, the bread and the juice together.